Okay, hello everyone. Um, before we get started today, I, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that the park is streaming from is the unceded territory of Indakana, belonging to the Abenaki peoples whose traditions have stewarded this land for thousands of years and continue to this day. We thank them for their strength and resilience and caring for this land, and we aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. I encourage you all to take the first step in researching and learning more about the original stewards of the land you are coming in from. Thank you for joining me for that important land acknowledgement. Um, so my name is Joey Sullivan and uh, I am, this is the first installment of our mini series on wildlife tracking. So if you attended our first workshop um, last month, uh, that was kind of an introduction to wildlife tracking, but we did not get through everything we wanted to. So we're gonna be putting on this mini series uh, getting through different animal families. Um, so this is the first of three and really excited to bring this to you all. Um, my name is Joey Sullivan and I am the one year natural resources management intern at both Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park and St. Gaudens National Historical Park located in Vermont and New Hampshire respectively. Um, one of my projects at the park is coordinating these working woodlands workshops, which is the way we bring our natural resources to the public and they're designed to engage nat nature enthusiasts and landowners in conserving, appreciating, and managing woodlands or property. Um, these workshops normally take place in person, but obviously due to COVID-19, we've adapted them to be virtual for the foreseeable future. Really hoping while I'm still here, we'll get a chance to do an in-person one, but I'm not gonna hold my breath on it. Um, uh, like I said, today is the first of our mini series. So today we're going to be focusing on bobcats, coyotes, and their cousins. Um, Ed Sharon will be our presenter. He is a park ranger and science communication specialist for the National Park Service. Um, he is our wildlife tracking expert. Um, he knows more than anyone I know. Um, and yeah, now that we've gotten that through, I'll pass it over to Ed. Ed, if you want to take it away. Great, sure. Yep. Uh, thanks a lot, Joey. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, yep. So we are going to uh, kind of dive right in in just a minute here. I will say, um, I think Joey mentioned that the other program was recorded. So um, if you haven't had a chance to kind of see the other one, which does a lot more introduction to kind of the ins and outs of, you know, why tracking is important and interesting and kind of uh, goes into a little a lot more depth about, you um, Kind of the basics of understanding tracking. Um, that's uh, probably a good place to go. Um, you know, you'll be able to follow along today, no problem as well too, but it's good to um, have that background as well. So just uh, kind of FYI. Um, all right, let me um, try sharing my screen here. Hopefully you can see the flat hat uh, ranger, uh, park ranger hat over there. And then with any luck, you should also be able to see uh, the presentation. You see that, Joey? Is that coming through? Yep, looks great. Excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, I will say um, just as a way of a very brief introduction, um, you know, tracking, uh, as you know, if you went to the first one and as uh, you, know, you know, if you are a tracker, um, it's just a really great way to get outside, a really great way to kind of um, explore the mysteries of, uh, you know, the, the, of nature around you. If, uh, seeing some holes in the snow, which, you know, are animal tracks or scat or feeding sign, and then trying to kind of figure out what happened, putting the pieces together and understanding, you know, why an animal went that way, what the way it was moving, maybe what it ate, uh, what its mood was, all those kinds of things you can tell um, from tracking, which is pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, as I like to call this kind of, uh, since we are mystery solvers and since there are a lot of uh, kind of TV detective shows out there that uh, you know, are also mystery solvers, of course, you know, different things of crimes. This isn't necessarily really crimes. This is just of what, you know, animals have been doing, but it's similar in the sense that you're using all your kind of senses and trying to, again, piece together clues of what you saw out there. So that is why I do call this TSI, Track and Sign Investigation. Quarantine edition, of course. And these are all our all our animals that are uh, out there. So 
that, and all the ones that left those signs. So we're gonna um, get right into the animals here. Um, and we do have, uh, yeah, we're gonna focus on kind of the, the, the dogs and cats of, uh, you know, the, uh, of our, the wild world, uh, not so much the ones at our houses, but the ones that we might encompass uh, in the forest, uh, you know, especially in the Northeast here, this is where this is mainly based, but a lot of these animals are all across the, uh, all across the country. And as I mentioned in the first presentation, you know, it does seem like they're, that it's an overwhelming list, but once you start breaking them down into their families, you know, the mustelids, the, uh, the weasels, and the rodents as well, the, the, the canids, the dogs, the, the felids, the cats, you know, you can kind of um, see that they share many similarities um, and it helps you kind of categorize them a little bit more than just trying to figure out, you know, um, coming at it uh, just by all these animals that you see listed here and trying to figure out what you're seeing just by doing that can be a little overwhelming. So, um, and you'll see that as we go through the presentation today that you know, these are, uh, there's gonna be a, many similarities between the, uh, the um, kind of the cousins within their families here. So we'll start with the gray fox, um, which is why we didn't have time to uh, get into last time. And they are um, amazing animals. A lot of people don't even realize that we have them uh, in the Northeast and, and not even just Northeast, all around the country because they are um, pretty secretive. Um, they're mainly active you know, towards nighttime. Um, a lot of animals that we have here are uh, kind of the, the 10 cent word for that is crepuscular. Uh, meaning that they're they're active mostly at dawn and dusk and into the night, um, and these animals are really good at not uh, being seen by people, even though they are out and about, um, you know, more so than you might imagine, especially in the forests. Um, and they are, um, you know, again on the smaller side of uh, you know, kind of the dog family, uh, as you may remember from the red foxes uh, that we talked about last time. You know, red foxes are surprisingly small as well too, somewhere between the range of eight to 12 pounds. So these are actually right in that same category. Except they look a little bit smaller maybe because they don't tend to have as uh, puffy of coats. Even their, their tails aren't quite as um, you know, puffy as the same as, uh, as a red fox. So they look a little slimmer, but they are about the same size. Um, and they're unique uh, in the sense of kind of the, the, the dog world in that they are very comfortable climbing trees. Um, you can see you know, this red fox in the picture on the right here, uh, gray fox, excuse me, uh, climbing this tree and it's not uncommon for them to do that. They have semi-retractable claws, which again is unusual for dogs um, and they use them to their advantage to climb uh, trees and, and things of that nature. So some people kind of think of them as a, as a, you know, a hybrid almost between a dog and a cat. They, they do live you know, comfortably in the dog world, but they do share similar traits to cats, which is, uh, you know, kind of, um, and it makes them a, you know, a very interesting animal. You can see this one also got its dinner. Um, it's got the uh, gray squirrel wow. up there, which again, gives you a good idea of the size of the animal. It's, you know, it's a pretty substantial meal um, for a gray fox, which is one of the primary things that they do hunt as well. <clears throat> um, and kind of keeping in theme with talking about how they share some characteristics with cats. Um, they do tend to have a uh, rounder um, paws than uh, dogs do, uh, other dogs do uh, in, in the uh, dog family like coyotes and uh, red fox, um, which shows up in their tracks. Um, then their claws are only semi-retractable. Um, so you don't always see uh, them in their tracks. You do most times, but you won't always see them because uh, they kind of sit up higher on the paw. So depending on what they're moving through, depends on whether or not you'll see their claws. Um, and these are some photos of the tracks in different situations. <clears throat> um, we can see here that, uh, you know, these are two tracks, obviously, a front and a hind on this one, same with this one here. Um, and here's a front paw here and a hind paw here. Um, if we have a chance to, to get into the red fox again today, um, you might remember if you saw last time as well too, that they also move in, in a way that kind of their, their front and hind feet land in the same spot, but red fox are known as what they call as, as a perfect direct register. And all that means is that you know, when the fox's front foot leaves the spot, its hind foot lands basically perfectly on top of where that front foot was. It looks like there's only one track there. 
Whereas gray fox tend to be more of what they call it an imperfect direct register animal in the sense that you can see obviously here that the hind foot and it didn't land perfectly on top of where the front foot was. Uh, same with the, and this one here too. So that's a, a, a kind of a diagnostic thing when you're trying to figure out the difference maybe between a red fox and a gray, gray fox if you don't have you know, really clear pictures. These are um, you know, unusually nice tracks um, of gray fox here, very clear definition of the toes and the pads. And you, know, uh, you can see in the photos of their feet here as well, <clears throat> that their feet, now they do have a fair amount of hair on there, but you can see very clear toe pads as well too. And those usually show up you know, in the right condition very well on the tracks too. So, which not, not as true for red fox. Red fox tend to have furrier feet all times of year, but especially in winter. Um, so even the, you know, this winter photo of this gray fox, which I took in Vermont um, here, um, all these are in Vermont actually, but uh, this is obviously a winter photo <clears throat> and uh, you know, very clear toe pads that are still in there. And you can see their claws too, um, which you, know, you actually see them in the mud here too. If you look really closely, they're uh, just kind of poking up in the, in the mud there, but a little harder to see in, in, the, in the rear track here. So uh, again, kind of those claws do sit a little higher up on the paw. Um, but as I was, I uh, know if you were in the last program too, uh, you know that I, I don't really like to focus too heavily on individual tracks. Uh, it's great to do that. It's great to become an expert on you know, identifying the characteristics of all the tracks. It's certainly going to help you in your tracking. Um, but uh, I find it more helpful to focus on the way the animal moves, uh, the way it's its preferred mode of transportation. What I mean by that is you know, how its feet land um, and, and kind of the, the style and the way it moves. And then you can kind of, you know, once you've got that down, you can focus more in on the actual tracks themselves and, and really kind of dial down on what you think the species might be. And for gray fox, you know, they do have, we already mentioned a, a, a couple of characteristics of that in the sense that, uh, you know, they are imperfect direct register animals. And you can see that um, here as well, too. So this is by direct register. Again, I mean a front foot. You know, landed here and came out and was moving through the air when that hind foot landed almost exactly um, right where that same hole was. And again, this is you know classic um, energy um, conserving behavior by animals, um, especially in conditions where you know there's uh, kind of a, maybe a harder um, substrate to move through. Substrate meaning what the animal's on. You know, snow obviously in this case, and the deeper the snow, the harder it is for them to move through. As as we all know, as uh, you know, people who you know, have ever been in snow before. So, using that same hole that you just created with the front foot for your hind foot, you know, saves about you know half as much energy. You know, if, uh, you, know, if you think about it, because you're using that same hole that you just made with your front foot for your hind foot. So it's you know, it's a lot easier. Gray fox tend to travel in this direct register, you know, no matter what um, they're going through. You know, it's not uh, uncommon to see it in, in any kind of substrate. So, um, but you know, for sure they, they will do it when, when the snow starts to get a little bit deeper. Um, and this is also a good way to see um, a general rule of thumb for all animals in tracking is that the faster the animal moves, the straighter the line of tracks is going to be. Um, so, you know, if you had to guess, you could probably say that the animal on the left here you know, was not moving as quickly as the animal on the right. Um, you know, pretty clear that these tracks are a lot closer to each other than these. And also, you know, the slower the animal goes in general, the closer the together the tracks are going to be. So, you know, these are a little closer together and zigzag a little bit more than these do as this animal is moving a little bit faster. So that's going to be true. You know, basically for any animal um, uh, that, that moves in this way, <clears throat> you're, you're going to see that, you know, except for kind of the hoppers, like hares and rabbits and things like that, and some of the rodents, but for, you know, dogs and cats, uh, for sure, um, that's what you're going to see. Um, another very common um, way that the red fox, the gray fox moves, that makes it a little bit unusual in its family is that it likes to utilize this, what's called the straddle trot. Um, if you look closely at this photo, you'll see that um, the, the way the feet move, um, land changes with every single stride. So in other words, you've got a front right foot here and a rear left foot here and a front and, and a rear right and rear left here. 
Um, and you can see it zigzags, right? The, the rear foot is on the left side in this photo and the rear foot is on the right side in this photo. And it does that, you know, as far as you can see up along the trail here. And um, this is usual um, for many animals like coyotes and, and bobcats and, and red fox. We use this, it's considered to be a transition prop, meaning, you know, if they're kind of coming into an area very quickly and they, then they want to change their gait to, um, you know, a walk or a different kind of trot. Uh, for whatever reason, it's helped for the animals to use this gait like for two or three strides, usually something like that, maybe a little bit more. And then you'll see the gait change into something completely different. So from a run to a straddle trot to a walk or, you know, a different kind of uh, trot up ahead. But gray fox use this, use this um, way of moving for, for long distances. Um, you'll see it for large stretches of uh, the way they move. So again, it's, it's very helpful with, and, and diagnostic um, you know, when you're out there in the woods trying to figure out what you're seeing. That's just another kind of you know, check mark you can put in the box for um, gray fox if you're seeing you know, many things that are leading you towards gray fox and then you see a large stretch of tracks that, that look like this. You know, it's, it's even more confidence that you can have that you're seeing a gray fox uh, moving through the woods there. Um, whenever possible, I always like to photograph tracks of two animals um, side by side. Um, obviously, you don't always have that opportunity. <clears throat> but the reason I like to do that is because I don't really bring a tape measure with me into the woods that often. Um, you know, when you're first starting out, it can be helpful for sure. And if you really want to, uh, you know, get into the nitty gritty and carry a journal with you and you know, write these things down, you know, definitely do that. Um, but the reason I like doing this is because I you know, when possible, I like to be able to compare tracks in size so that I have relative sizes to compare them to. Um, I don't really need to know that, you know, it's uh, two and an eighth inch uh, to two and three quarters of an inch kind of size or whatever. I mean, again, helpful, but if I just kind of want to get a basic idea of the way animals uh, are in relative sizes to each other, you know, it's obviously great if you have like a red fox and a gray fox uh, and then move side by side, you know, go through the same area and get photographed side by side. Is helpful, but any species I like to do it with. So, you know, this is a porcupine that was uh, going through the same area that a gray fox is going through. So, you know, you can see relative size difference there, even though porcupines are squatter, they are, uh, you know, pretty heavy animals compared to a gray fox. So, it's always nice to be able to see those things side by side. <clears throat> and this is uh, one of the situations that I kind of call a special case study. You'll come across um, you know, these kinds of things and all uh, animal tracks that you might follow out in the woods. Um, and this uh, right here in particular, this kind of set of tracks, um, this is what's known kind of in the tracking world as a, as a tea stop, because it kind of, you know, if you use your imagination, you can make a tea out of it. And what that means is, you know, the animal literally did stop here for a moment or two um, for one reason or another, and then decided to move on. And, um, you know, that's always something of interest when the animal stops. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, cur curiosity has been piqued and um, it's wanting to look at something uh, that it's seeing um, or smell something or, you know, there's something that's caught its attention or, or for whatever reason, it's decided to stop and pay attention to something very closely. And if you look at these, uh, this photo very closely, you might see, um, well, first of all, actually, I think, yeah, here we go. I have uh, an image of a gray fox in a T-stop. So you can see its front two feet are down, which is, you know, these two tracks here, and then its hind feet are just behind, behind it there, and that's these two tracks. So you get an idea of front two feet, hind feet, you can almost get an idea of the size of the animal, too, um, when you have, uh, you know, you can put the tracks together like that, which is pretty neat. And also, what was the animal doing when it was standing here? Well, if you look closely, um, you can see that a, uh, a white-tailed deer actually went across uh, the tracks here. Uh, there's old tracks. Uh, obviously, it's been snowed over since that's happened, but the gray fox was coming up and must have got a whiff that an animal had gone through here, it probably stuck its nose in here, figured out, all right, it's a white-tailed deer. You know, um, it's, that's great. I'm not too interested in it. I'll move on. But if you again, if you look really closely as well too you'll see here that it even decided to uh, put a little scent mark down there um, this is where so you get a pretty good idea that it was most likely a male uh, lifted a leg uh, left a little bit of a scent mark there kind of diagnosing you know, saying that all right i smelled this i know what it is i know i'm, I'm good with this i'm going to move on if i come across this again in some you know 
time in the future and I smell my own scent mark there, you know, it's going to be something that I know that I had marked already and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, finding this white tailed deer moving through, you know, its territory here, that sort of much. So um, it's just, a, you know, an interesting way to be able to see how the animal is, uh, you know, um, thinking about what it was seen there. There's another neat uh, sign that you'll come across uh, if you follow tracks for a while. Um, this is, we're looking at this spot here in particular. So, you know, um, this you can see kind of, you know, a longer feet um, here, the hind feet, the haunches really, and the front two feet here, and even this puffy area in the snow back here, which, you know, as you might imagine, is the animal's tail. And we're going to zoom in a little bit more to the situation here, but this is where the gray fox had a seat for a minute. Um, you, know, you can see where that's where its tail was uh, and the snow here and it's, you know, its hind feet uh, are right here and its front two feet here. <clears throat> and then uh, what you see up ahead here is actually a spot where a river otter um, went by in the woods uh, at some point or another. So, you know, not <laughs> exactly sure what happened here, but, uh, you know, I talked about before kind of the, the theater of your mind, you know, theater of my mind, as Gray Fox was trotting along, saw a uh, river otter headed through the woods, headed this way, had a seat, watched the river otter go by it, um, you know, kind of like in the cartoons where that, that stop sign comes down. This is an intersection here. So stop sign came down, the red fox had a seat, river otter went by, and then the red fox, the gray fox continued on its way because you can see its tracks are on top of where this otter went by. So the otter did go by first. Um, probably didn't happen that way. It probably happened in you know, different times, but it's uh, you know, a fun uh, kind of thing to think about. You know, why it sat right there where that river otter would buy. Um, you know, the snow that I took this photo in, it happened pretty recently, only like the day before. So you know, this was, um, you know, it didn't happen that long ago between these two animals went by there. So um, you know, just things that happened in the woods that you, you know you don't get to see, you know, but you can think about anyway. Um, so that's a uh, gray fox there. Um, I'm going to go ahead to Eastern Coyote because again, we did uh, red fox last time in the interest of time. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to get through more animals that we didn't have last time. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the Eastern Coyote here with uh, a nice snack. Sorry, that's a little graphic for you there. Um, but uh, they are, uh, you know, they do eat a lot of well, not a lot of deer, but that is a primary part of their diet um, here uh, in the East for sure, which is a good thing because there's plenty of uh, um, white-tailed deer and you know, the coyote is really one of the only animals that can take down an adult deer, especially in winter that we have around here. Um, you know, they, they have uh, good luck doing that here. Um, and they are, um, you know, if you've ever been out west to places like uh, Yellowstone um, and other places out there where you might have a chance to see a coyote, and you may notice that our coyotes are quite a bit larger um, than the ones that we, you've seen out west. Um, they, up here, they're you know, between 35 and 60 pounds. Uh, very rarely they can exceed 70 pounds. Most of them are right in the 35, 40 pound range, but you know, there are individuals that have been trapped or shot um, that do, you know, weigh over 60 pounds uh, around the east. So, you know, a significant sized animal for sure. Um, the reason why our coyote is so much larger than its western cousins is because it is um, actually a blend of different animals. Um, it's been thought, you know, for, for decades um, of us thought that the eastern coyote might have some wolf or dog in it, but before the days of kind of DNA testing, it was only theory. Um, but in the recent you know, decade, last decade or so, even a little bit less than that, and there's been many studies of uh, coyote DNA here in the East. Um, and coyotes have only been in the East for you know, a short period of time as far as animals go. You know, really, the 1950s, I think some of the first ones were seen in the East. I don't think the first one in Vermont was seen until about 1970. Um, so, you know, again, just, uh, you know, a blip in the radar back in time uh, as far as this goes. Uh, it's a very recent arrival that they've been here. Um, and you can see that they are a blend of, you know, kind of the Western coyote. This particular study, anyway, here that, that looked at 437 Eastern coyotes, um, found that their study showed 64% coyote, about 13% gray wolf, 13% Eastern wolf, and 10% dog. So it's quite a blend of uh, different animals. And the best uh, theory that scientists have that this is the case is that 
Um, you know, eastern coyotes, were, uh, western coyotes were expanding their range eastward, um, bumped into uh, some wolf populations, especially around the Great Lakes area. And wolves in that area were under a lot of stress. Their um, territories were shrinking, their populations were shrinking. And usually wolves and coyotes don't get along very well, but they think that, um, you know, wolves under stress actually, you know, did decide um, to mate with coyotes. Um, and as that kind of, you know, that progress continued east, they came across, you know, other wolf populations, they came across some dogs, you know, wild dogs, uh, you know, stray dogs, uh, or even, you know, pet dogs that got out um, and, and mated with them too. And now we have this kind of, you know, ongoing soup <laughs> of a, uh, a, a wild dog uh, out in our woods right now. And it's koi wolf. Scientists don't like to call it a koi wolf. You know, they kind of stick with the Eastern coyote, which is you know, a subspecies of coyote. Um, it's a little more kind of accurate as far as you know, they're concerned. So I try not to use that word koi wolf too much, but Eastern coyote definitely works. And again, um, they share characteristics of all those animals. Um, you know, very intelligent. Uh, they don't tend to pack um, the same way that uh, wolves do, but they do tend to be in family units anyway, of usually dominant male, female for the area, and then, you know, two to three pups, um, uh, you know, from that year that stay together. So, you know, in general, somewhere between, you know, five animals or maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, um, depending on, you know, kind of where you are and what the animals are doing. Um, and they also share, you know, they sound like a kind of a combination between wolves and uh, Western coyotes as well. Uh, I'm going to play this sound here, hopefully you can hear it. But, so it's kind of a combination of a howl and the, the yips that you hear in general of, uh, you know, coyotes. And if you've been in the East for a while, you've probably heard this. Um, some people, it makes their skin crawl. Some people think it's, it's really cool. I'm, I'm right up there in the really cool category. And I think it's uh, really amazing to be able to hear this in our woods. <clears throat> and there's a kind of a, you know, a rumor or a myth out there that that's what they do uh, right before they're going hunting um, or to celebrate a kill or something like that. Um, and you know, the general theory that uh, seems to get the most credit of why they do that it's mostly actually a reunion of uh, when the, the animals have been apart for a while, a family group, and they get together again, and they kind of uh, make those those sounds. They don't generally want to announce when they're going on the hunt. It doesn't make sense for them to, you know, kind of give the deer a head start or whatever animals they're trying to hunt and say, here we come, you know, right or not, here we come by doing all those sounds. So it's more likely that they are um, actually, you know, that's after uh, they've gotten back together again, and they'll make those kind of sounds. Um, and looking at kind of, uh, you know, the way a, a coyote is built, first we'll just look briefly at its skull, um, just because it, it's indicative of what it can hunt and, and what kind of, you know, how um, kind of diverse it is. It has a very large, you know, kind of brain case here, um, large, powerful jaws, you know, the, 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 of course, the canine teeth and the carnassial teeth here for, you know, shearing kind of uh, meat off the bones of uh, what they eat. and this uh, prominent feature here too, this is a kind of a part of, on the skull that you'll see on animals that have very strong jaws. Um, so things like bears, things like coyotes here, wolves, um, the male fisher, if you saw the last program also has this on its head. It's called the sagittal crest and it's where the muscles of the, the jaw bone connect to. So the muscles kind of run all along the skull down underneath the jaw here. So it gives good purchase for those muscles. Um, it allows them to have very strong um, bites, very strong jaws. So, um, and that's what allows them to kind of crunch through, um, you know, not to again get too graphic for you, but through bone um, to get to the marrow um, and you know, be able to reach that part, which is very nutritious um, that a lot of animals just don't have the jaw strength to get to. <clears throat> um, and in general, looking at, you know, kind of the difference between a domestic dog track and a coyote track. Um, you can see, you know, there's so many different kinds of domestic dogs, of course, and some of them, you know, maybe are very obviously not coyote, but some of them can look a little bit closer to coyote and it's a little harder to tell. But, you know, in general, um, there's some things that you can look at for sure. Um, you know, one of the rules of thumb is coyotes spend most of their time in the woods, um, not on paved hard surfaces. So their claws tend to be very sharp. Um, you'll see that in the claw, claw marks that's left behind. 
whereas domestic dogs, you know, often have their toes clipped or you no, know, they're walking a lot on, you know, hardwood floors and pavement and stuff. And they just tend to look a lot duller in the tracks, which is one of the things you can do. Um, also, coyotes, wild dogs, their tracks are um, symmetrical. Um, and they can kind of draw the X in the middle of the tracks there. And you can't really do that in some of these domestic dog tracks. Um, this one, it can be a little bit more. The reason I have this uh, interesting photo pop up is that also to show um, that coyotes um, are um, what are called digit grade animals, meaning they walk on their digits, on their toes, on their tiptoes, as opposed to animals like humans, which were called the plantigrade or flat footed. You know, we walk on our heels. Um, and the reason that's interesting is that you know, all you have to do is look at kind of a, a, an Olympic sprinter um, to see why it's advantageous to do this. Um, right before they're starting their sprints, of course, when they're saying on your mark, get set, go. When they say you know, on your mark and get set, they go up on their toes. They kind of lift themselves up because it's a lot, you can kind of spring into action a lot faster that way than if you had to start flat footed. And with an animal that's you know, making its living, either trying to uh, you know, catch animals or trying to avoid being caught, um, you know, just that split second, and literally it's sometimes it's just a, you know, less than a second advantage, um, can be the difference between you know, life and death, the difference between getting a meal and not getting a meal. So a lot of these animals that are, that are hunters like this um, are you know, digit grade animals uh, that you need to move fast as opposed to like black bears, which are, uh, those are also flat red animals. That, you know, they're so large and everything, that they, they don't really need the speed um, that an animal like a coyote and a fox and a bobcat and things like that do. So um, you know, interesting way to see the way these animals are, are laid out. <clears throat> Looking uh, closely at their feet, you can see, um, you know, that again, there's fur between the toes, but not a lot of fur surrounding it. So that's, you know, and their tracks um, it shows up pretty clearly. You can see their, their toe pads very well. And again, here's that uh, diagnostic X marks the spot uh, that you can see in these dog tracks, uh, very symmetrical, fold, fold them over on each other, um, which is not true for some of the domestic dog species and, and for cat species as well. So um, you know, that's something that you can look for uh, in, in coyote tracks as well. And in general as well, um, when you're looking at coyote tracks, uh, they tend to be a lot neater. You know, they tend to go in a straight line a lot more. They tend to be more business-like. They tend to look like they're headed somewhere, uh, as opposed to domestic dog tracks, which you know, if you have a dog, you know, when you let your dog out, it's it's excited, it's running around, it's checking everything out. It's you know, more time often than not, it is running. It's not walking or trotting unless it's on a leash. Um, you know, you, you'll see um, kind of going all over the place and you don't generally see that with wild animals you know, nearly as much. Usually it's much more business-like um, than going from one spot to another. Of course, there are occasions where, you know, especially the younger animals are playing, they're you know, trying to establish dominance over each other, that kind of thing. You'll see a little bit more variation in it. But uh, for the most part, especially when animal traveling alone, <laughs> you're gonna see a lot more kind of business-like, um, you know, kind of movement on them. And um, these tracks here, what you're seeing, um, this is a very common um, way for dogs to move, uh, wild and domestic. Um, what we're seeing here is something called the side trot, also known as the canine trot sometimes, because it is so common in dogs. And uh, what you're seeing here is a front foot and a hind foot, front hind, front hind, front hind, same on this front hind, the hind always landing in front where the front foot was. Um, and this is, uh, you know, if you can see it, um, you, an actual animal moving, you can see something like this. Its rear end is always kind of uh, kicked out to one side, um, which allows that hind foot to move past the front foot without kind of, you know, smashing into the back of it when it's moving, because it's moving fast enough where that front, that hind foot, you know, needs to pass the front foot before landing. Um, if it was a much slower gait, like a walk, the hind foot could land behind the front foot, but when it's moving a little bit faster, um, you know, the hind foot lands in front. <laughs> and uh, you see it, and this is a red fox here. You see it common um, in red fox and coyotes and wolves. Um, that is, uh, and in your own dog too. If you, you know, call your dog over and it's coming at you kind of in a trot, look at it, see if its rear end is kicked out to the side a little bit. Because um, your dog is often going to move in this, uh, this canine trot as well too, this, this side trot is a common way for them to do this. Incidentally, you're seeing uh, cottontail tracks, uh, rabbit tracks uh, moving across this, this frozen pond here as well. So 
um, kind of again the uh, comparison size. And uh, getting more into the details of the way you know coyotes and you know all other animals with four legs can move. You know again there's the the the, uh, the trots, the walks, the, the all out uh, you know kind of lopes and the all out runs as well too. The gallops um, is what we're seeing in different situations here. So um, you know this is what we saw with the gray fox and the red fox as well too. This is again that direct register trot. Um, certainly coyotes will use that as well. <clears throat> um, they'll walk um, too as well, maybe a little bit more so than um, I've seen with foxes and um, red fox and gray fox. You'll see coyotes kind of walking through their territory a little bit more. And this is a little bit faster of a walk. There's an overstep walk and there's an understep walk. Um, and by the definition of you know, what you're hearing, you might be able to guess what that means. Uh, an understep walk means the hind foot lands behind the front foot, and an overstep walk means that it lands in front of the foot, front foot. And here you can see some nice drag marks, actually, of where the hind foot went around the front foot, you know, stepped over the front foot, I should say, um, where it was, um, and left those tracks the way that you see here. So a slightly faster walk um, than an understep walk. And this is to compare that to a domestic dog. And even here, you know, it's a short section, but you can kind of see um, it's, you know, I would describe it as sloppier. It's definitely not as neat as this walking pattern of a, of a coyote in the woods um, that you see here in this domestic dog tracks. Uh, you're just, uh, you know, even when they're walking, it's not quite as, uh, as precise as it looks like with the wild cousins. <clears throat> And um, coyotes also, of course, uh, have the ability to uh, gallop, to run. Um, this is uh, looking at uh, the way that the feet land. It's basically land in sections of four. So we're only seeing the top two tracks in this one here, this section of four here, this section of four, where the two front feet land and the two hind feet land. So again, getting that general rule of thumb, the faster the animal goes, um, the farther the hind feet tend to land in front of the front feet. So, you know, there's a pretty good distance between the hind feet and the front feet on here. Um, there's no overlap. So, you know, this, uh, this gallop here is actually, you know, a, a gallop is the fastest way that these animals will move. There's a different, a couple of different options they have to do a gallop, but this is uh, one of the faster ones here. And I'm going to try to share a video here. I know, um, it's a little bit uh, wonky to do it. Um, so I'm going to make sure, I know I think I have to stop sharing my screen and reshare it again to get this video going. So um, let's hope that works. Uh, I'm going to start this video here. Um, and then let's see. Ed, we can see the video. Oh, you can. Um, oh. When you did that before, yeah. Excellent. All right. I don't know why it's working, but I'm not going to question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's go ahead. I think I fast forward to about three minutes. This is from a, this guy has this great YouTube channel about uh, animals that he has. I, I forget what it's called, but we can look it up later if, you, if you're interested. This is a Massachusetts. Um, this was of uh, obviously wild turkeys here, but in a second we're going to see um, a, a unusually large group of coyotes move through here. These are radio collared, so they knew exactly where they're going. And the reason I really like this video too is because these coyotes very conveniently move and um, all sorts of different patterns and gates. This is obviously a walk and uh, hopefully I can kind of move us forward here. So I was talking about an understep walk here before. So you clearly uh, its hind feet is landing behind where that their front foot just was. So very slow, you know, kind of non-threatening, not, it's not threatened. Uh, it's not feeling threatened. It's, um, you know, kind of very slowly moving through an area here, at, you know, with, with curiosity um, and feeling in no rush to move along. So, you know, kind of an understep walk is one of the slower ways these animals can move. Um, and then conveniently right behind it comes, uh, I think you're still doing an understep walk if uh, I am correct. Well, actually, I think this is a little bit, believe it or not, slightly faster. So watch where this front foot is, watch where this rear foot lands. It lands in front of where that front foot just was. The front foot left here is high foot landed there. So it's, you know, to the naked eye, it's kind of hard to tell, but that animal is moving a little bit faster um, than that one that was uh, just going through. So this is an overstep walk. Um, so, you know, and just slightly faster. And then even better, we'll back you up. Obviously a trot was happening right there. Um, 
And this one is a, a direct register trot. So um, we will watch as this animal's feet move. You know, this is, this is that very bouncy direct register trot. So as that front foot leaves that space, that hind foot's gonna land just about exactly where that front foot was. So boom, right there, same one with this one here. Um, this bouncy direct register trot. So, you know, a little bit of a faster way to move through and, uh, you know, an amazing way to see that, uh, you know, just another variation of the way they can move. <clears throat> I think most of the other animals that are gonna move here, and this is, a, you know, again, usually, again, it's a, something like three to five animals. This is a, actually, I think, all right, that looked a little different. That might've been a side trot, believe it or not. Let's see if we can get um, that there again. So again, this is much larger group of, Coyotes and I'm used to seeing, I think all counted, it was something like seven to nine animals that came through here, which is uh, again, unusual. So this might look a little bit faster, but you can see already here that a front leg is here and a hind foot is coming around it. This might actually even be the straddle trot, believe it or not. All right, because here we have um, same side of the body, the right side of the body here where um, the hind foot is coming around the right front leg there. And I think we're gonna see the opposite happened on the other side, left side there. And then you can see that rear foot is going around that front foot. So this is the straddle trot. Um, so this animal is moving, you know, probably gonna change its gait any second now um, into a, another way to move, but it's uh, you know, decided um, that it's wanted to move, use that straddle trot kind of coming through that, that area there. So that's cool to be able to see. So we've already seen like three or four different um, gates. I think there's even yet another, Coyote that's going to come through. Uh, this one is a little more cautious. Oh, and all right, that one just ran through in a, in a lope or a gallop. Um, this one is, looks like it's going to be doing the, let's see there, that appears to be, that's the side trot because you can see that it's, um, the rear foot is landing on that same side of the body on, on both of these ones. So let's see if we can get that there. So as it comes through here, um, looks like that is on the inside of the track there. So it's rear end, it's hard to tell, and this was probably pushed out away from us a little bit. So that's why that rear leg um, just landed to the inside of the, the right leg there. But then you'll see it, and the same thing is going to be there. That's going to be on the outside of that. So it's going to leave that uh, kind of diagonal um, track that we saw there with the, uh, with the side trot. So I think we've got another gate there. And again, very large. Um, group of coyotes here. I can't remember. I think yeah, there's yet another one coming through here. Um, and hopefully this one, that's very quick um, trot. And then it just switched. That was probably a, um, you know, a switching from his gate into a, a, an all out uh, lope there or gallop. Never seen that one go through. You couldn't really see his legs very well, but yeah, so I know that was a lot um, right there, but that was like, I think you know, again, that was pretty amazing to be able to see um, all those animals that move in that those particular different ways there. Um, and a couple other uh, special case scenarios here. Um, I want to move a little bit faster because we do want to get into the cats here too. But this is, um, you know, you'll see coyotes don't always find a den to lay down on. This is actually a perfect kind of circular spot where a coyote spent there was a couple spots or nearby, I saw some other ones where there's another coyote that spent the night with it there. Hard to tell in this photo, but this is actually on a little bit of an uphill, you know, a little bit of a rise in the woods. So it has kind of a nice 360 degree uh, view. You know, also might be slightly warmer being up high, cold air, of course, sinks. So, you know, it's not quite as cold there um, when it's, you know, when they're out in the open, but they don't always need to den up, you know, um, there's such good winter insulation that they will sometimes spend the nights or you know, a few hours resting here and there, uh, right out in the open. Um, this is a camera I set up uh, a while ago where it was cold, it was below zero. My camera didn't go to below zero. I think it was about 20 below zero this night. And this is a big sugar maple that had fallen over and that coyote did um, spend uh, you know, several hours um, <clears throat> underneath this for a little bit, possibly a little bit more shelter. Um, um, it's down there, some leaves and everything that were in there from the uh, maple that had fallen. And, um, you know, it did den up in there, which is uh, you know, pretty neat you know, to see that as well. Uh, I didn't do too much of a close-up view of this because, again, I don't you know people might not necessarily like seeing this kind of stuff, but it's, it is part of nature, of course, and it is um, how coyotes keep themselves alive and keep their young alive and make sure there's new generation and also help keep the deer population a little lower because 
we do have a lot of deer here that do you know a fair amount of damage to our forests um, you know with wildflowers and young trees and helping spread invasive species all sorts of things um, that having too many deer is not good for um, but coyotes are one of the few animals again especially the snow gets deeper they can take down an adult sized deer that are having tr more trouble moving through the snow and they can consume that entire deer carcass you know, I came across this in the National Park, actually, which is a while ago now. But the next day I came by, there was nothing left. Um, they had basically, there's only just a few shreds of hair here and there. They, you know, basically taken different parts of the, the, the deer and moved it around and probably, you know, ate its bones for a while as well, too, after that. So, um, they, you know, they do some, uh, they can take down a deer and eat it very quickly. And there's a lot of other animals, animals that take advantage of that as well once, um, you know, once that deer is down, whether the animals, animals will eat it as well. Um, so again, try to keep on moving here for time, um, getting some of the cats here. Of course, bobcat is the primary, primary wild cat that we have here in the Northeast. Um, and they can be pretty large, um, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 pounds. There was a record in New Hampshire of 52 pound bobcat, which is, you know, highly unusual. Um, you know, they're much, usually much smaller than that. Um, you know, a large male is 29 pounds and a large female is, uh, can be, you know, 20 pounds or so. Most of them are in that 14 to 20 pound category. Um, you can see in these photos here, um, this is a male bobcat and female. So you can see there is kind of, you know, do look stockier, the male than the female. Um, that you can see. This is a female here. She just sent marks um, here in this spot. This is in the National Park. Yeah, wow, 10 years ago now, crazy uh, how time goes by. But um, this was a trail camera I had set up there. Um, and cats, bobcats, all cats, of course, make some different sounds. You know, all wild cats will purr, um, including, you know, lynx and bobcat, and uh, of course, your own cat. But they also can make it known when they're not very happy. This is the sound of a not happy bobcat. Uh, I don't know if you just heard that, but my the snow just let go off my roof and made <laughs> a huge roaring sound. So uh, that wasn't the bobcat. That was actually uh, uh, my roof letting go of snow, which is a good thing, but not what it was supposed to hear. Let's try that again. Yeah, so and of course, you should never approach a wild animal, but especially when one's making a sound like that. It's not a, uh, a happy bobcat there. Um, and getting into their tracks, of course, you know, bobcats, all cats have, uh, you know, these very distinctive toe pads, uh, not a lot of hair on their feet, um, and they have retractable claws that don't often show in the tracks. Um, this is, uh, I always like to look, you know, as deeply at, at an animal as you can, just because it gives you a lot of insights of, you know, why they are the way they are and what they do. This is a you know a bobcat looking straight at you. This is a bobcat skull looking straight at you. And what the most prominent feature I would think of this is these amazingly huge uh, eye sockets. Um, and you can just barely see a little bit of their eye, you know what it is on their skull. But inside the skull, it uh, makes up a substantial portion. And of course, you know as all you're probably well aware, cats have extremely good night vision. Um, are very active at night often. Reason being, um, you know that their eyes have way more rod receptors than, than we do and can see very well in, in dark conditions. No animal can see in pure darkness, but you know when there's a little bit of light available, these animals can do very well. A night like last night, full moon, I mean, that would basically be you know probably close to broad daylight for these animals um, and see very well in conditions like that. So they're you know, highly adapted to that. They have very sharp teeth. They don't have any of the molars. Um, they're basically primarily meat eaters. They're all you know, kind of designed for catching and eating um, you know meat-based things uh, not plant-based things <clears throat> um, and again just looking more closely at their tracks a front track and a hind track we're going to zoom in here um, on this track to kind of demonstrate the difference between uh, dog and cat tracks you know side by side you can see very clear differences between them of course um, whereas you know the dogs have the, the claws that show cats that don't often show um, you have the X marks a spot on the dog. You can't do that in the cat. Cat tracks are not symmetrical. You cannot pull them over themselves. Even one of the toes um, tends to be a little higher than the other one on the front two tracks. Uh, front two toes, rather, um, you can see there. And on the hind track, too, um, more prominent on the front. But, uh, 
or in the high, but you can see that there as well. So, and you nice have this nice, you know, kind of draw this C around the, the heel pad here, C for cat. Um, you can see there, Jewel and Dibble Doo and the dog. And also there's uh, on perfect tracks like this, of course, you know, there's two bumps on the top of the heel pad and three on the bottom, which kind of makes an M. Uh, M for meow, C for cat. So you know, those things are kind of to help you uh, remember those kinds of things. Um, and this is a great uh, photo showing the difference between um, kind of a domestic cat and a, a, a bobcat. Domestic cats, for the most part, tend to have you know tracks a little over an inch in size, whereas bobcats are tend to be more in the two inch size. So you know, generally about twice as large as, as domestic cats. Otherwise, they look very similar. <clears throat> Um, and cats tend to, you know, their primary mode of transportation is uh, that direct register trot um, or direct register walk. They're, they're, they're big walkers as well, um, but they can also move a lot faster. Uh, this is actually the view of a cat that was in a, uh, in a run, actually. Um, and you know, the rule of thumb, again, you don't see their claws very often, but uh, you might see them sometimes in situations, especially where they might be trying to get a grip and move through an area a little bit faster. So this is cat tracks with claws. So that can, you know, this is the only track you saw that might throw you off a little bit. But this is uh, where a bobcat did have to extend its claws. And they move in these, uh, you know, we saw the understep and overstep walks with the coyotes. This is you know, what we're seeing here with this particular bobcat uh, moving through the snow. Um, I don't see close enough in there whether it was an overstep or an understep, but you would be able to uh, figure that out. It's actually coming out of a direct register walk here and then moving in to a different gate here and overstep or understep. You can see the differences there, which is neat. Um, here you can see kind of, uh, again, you can get a lot of idea about the style of the way this animal likes to hunt. Um, they are animals that will sit and wait, you know, a lot more than um, some other animals will when they're trying to uh, get something to eat. If they know that there's a prominent area where squirrels are active or something else uh, is in this area, this is up on a hill again. It's a little hard to tell in this photo. But this bobcat had a seat right here. Um, this is where its haunches were down. Um, and uh, you know, front two feet here, its haunches were down. And it was looking down that hill, waiting to see if there was something worthwhile to go after. It looks like it kind of moved to get rid of the cat there for a second. It started out kind of moving a little bit quickly there, but then these are very close together. This almost looks like it's a stock, um, you know, going at its slowest walk down that way there. So that makes me think something was uh, caught its attention was trying to get down there, um, you know, very slowly and quietly to not be seen. Um, and the other photo looks like it's even more of a stealthy look for the animal. Um, this you can see, you know, it actually was sitting, but then kind of got down into this really low crouch, like you'd see here. Um, so this animal wanted to make sure it was nicely hidden kind of up top there before um, it, it headed down. And again, kind of started out and you know more of a kind of almost jump to this um, next few here. And then again, has more of that uh, kind of um, stock going down that hill there. So this is something that I was trying to get close to. Um, and let's see, uh, yeah. Hopefully you guys can stay after one for a little bit for questions. I'm going to go right up to one o'clock just because I want to get um, Canada lynx in here as well too. Um, lynx uh, aren't common in our area by any means. So they're in Maine. Um, they've only recently been started to see in northern Vermont and uh, northern New Hampshire um, breeding pairs that I've been seen there. <clears throat> um, amazing, gorgeous, ghostly animal of the, of the of the forest. They really aren't do well don't do well on humans. Um, they do like to have large tracts of undisturbed forest territory. Their primary um, food is snowshoe hare, so snowshoe hare really needs to be um, readily available in that area. I think this lynx is about to make a pretty amazing uh, leap. This is a I think the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I got this video from. It's in Maine. Um, and they had these you know, out here to actually look for lynx to see if they're around there. So this uh, lynx just jumped like, you know, four or five feet and half a second there. Um, so they have an amazing leaping ability. <clears throat> the biggest difference between them and bobcats uh, is the size of their feet, enormous, you know, built in snowshoes. And you can see when they spread their toes, um, just how large their feet are on the foot and the hind feet here. Um, they do have more prominent ear tufts. Their coloring tends to be not quite as striped. The biggest difference though, um, I think I have, yeah, so you can see here between the two as the tip of the tail is the, the absolute dead giveaway for not sure. 
because on the bobcat, the, it's black on top and white on the bottom. And on the lynx, it's a pure black tip tail. So if you're moving away from me and you get a good look at its tail and you weren't sure, you could tell for sure uh, whether or not it's a bobcat or a lynx because of the tail. That's the, the, the you know, for lack of a better term, it's the tail tail uh, between the two of them there. And this is close up of uh, their feet. You know, again, enormous. Um, built in, they're built for deep snow, they're built for the north, they're built to. You have to move on top of snow to chase down snow tree hair and their primary um, thing that they're going to uh, try to hunt when they're out there. <clears throat> and uh, their toes tend to be spread apart more too as well because of the enormous size of their feet. So when they're walking in things like mud, you know, the, as opposed to that bobcat track that we saw, the toes are very much more spread uh, apart um, just because their feet are so large. Um, even even uh, in deep mud, uh, you know, their toes um, are noticeably spread apart as opposed to I do a bobcat side by side with the lengths here. So you no know, a very prominent difference between the tracks of the, of the two animals for sure. <clears throat> um, lengths like bobcat tend to be walkers. Um, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, walkers are direct register walk, direct register trot, whatever this is a direct register walk. Um, so again, that general rule of thumb of you know, the faster an animal goes, the straighter the line and the less zigzagging. So you can tell this is pretty slow because um, close together and kind of zigzagging as well, too. So it's you know, very typical for, for lynx to move in that way um, throughout their territory. And uh, yeah, this is just an example of an understep walk. You can see the, the hind foot there is hiding behind that front foot there. Um, and that leaves kind of these patterns um, that we see there. Um, yeah, if you can. If your eyes don't cross trying to follow all those different uh, pieces there, you can see that that's kind of how that a trail like that would be left. And extremely briefly, I just do want to touch on mountain lion because it is such a common question um, for this area. Um, you know, there are people who do, do have mountain lion um, sightings um, from time to time. However, um, there really are no um, mountain lions, at least no breeding population of mountain lions um, in our area at this time. Um, you know, the, there is an occasion where uh, I think in 2011 or so, um, a mountain lion was hit by a car in Connecticut. Um, and it was proven that through DNA that it did come from South Dakota. Um, somehow it walked all the way across interstates and everything to get here um, and was hit by a car eventually uh, in Connecticut. And uh, you know that animal was uh, was killed, unfortunately. But um, and really, for there to be a viable um, you know breeding population of animals here, obviously you need males and females, and it's just not um, happening in this area right now. Males will tend to venture off farther in search of a mate than a female will at this point, um, and we just haven't had that happen here in the Northeast. Um, there may you know. I, Often you'll know here that maybe somebody had a wild uh, a pet that they let go in the wild because they got sick of it or that kind of thing. I think that's more you know kind of speculation than what actually happens. Most often it's just a mistaken identity. You know, you get a glimpse of a large animal moving through, and a lot of people might think that they saw a mountain lion. And, you know, as we're learning more and more, human eyewitness testimony is not always the most accurate. That's in you know in court cases and crimes and all sorts of stuff, and it's certainly true when you get startled by a large animal moving by and then your memory kind of plays you a little bit and the animal gets bigger every time you think about it. And all that, <clears throat> because there are so many people out in the woods now, hunters, trappers, trackers, so many cell phones, so many um, wildlife cameras, and there hasn't been a single incident of one being caught on camera uh, you know, that's been proven. There haven't been good tracks that have been found and, uh, you know, consistently. There certainly are on occasion. I think there's been scat that's been proven to be uh, mountain lion scat, but again, um, you know, maybe one or two over the course of a couple of decades. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we're not talking by any means any kind of population here. Um, and there's no sign of, you know, there'd be many signs of deer being taken down by these animals. They take them down in different ways, they feed on them in different ways. So we've seen that uh, for sure, you know, much more consistently in the Northeast if they were around here. So uh, you know, long story short, there there's really no mountain lions or Sneak up. I said in my other program, never say never, never say always. So it's certainly possible that one that made it from South Dakota, you know, made it here and was seen for sure, it made it here. So it is possible, but um, you know, it's highly unlikely um, that you're going to ever come across a mountain lion, uh, either in person or see its signs uh, in the 
neighborhoods in the Northeast at the time, and no likely not for a long time yet. Um, so I think that brought me right to just past one. So um, sorry to take up all the time there, but again, I have time to answer any questions uh, for, for a little while if you have some, but uh, other than that, uh, thanks for indulging me in that long uh, one hour exploration of these animals. You can see, yeah, I don't know, I don't know that I've ever had time to go through all the animals on here. That would be like a six hour um, adventure. So um, just uh, one hour for, for all those was, uh, time goes by fast for me anyway. Hopefully it wasn't uh, <laughs> too long for you guys. Time flies by when you're having fun. Isn't that the saying? <laughs> um, so Ed, we've got uh, two questions here. Um, the first one is, is there a book on tracking in the North that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, several um, that, that I really like. Um, it's uh, one is called, if you're just getting into it, one is by Paul Resendez. I think it's called Tracking in the Art of Seeing. Has really what got me into it. Fantastic. He's a great storyteller. He's great photos. It's pretty short. Um, just a really good way to get into it. What's kind of known as the Bible of uh, tracking um, that you know around here is kind of uh, Mark Elbrock, E L B R O C H. Um, just recently published a second edition of uh, Animals, uh, think of, of North America, which is super thick, like 600 pages or so, and loaded with tracks and scat and you know all sort of, everything you could ever possibly want to know and imagine. He's like the most talented tracker that I've ever uh, come across. And, just an amazing uh, resource of things. So between those two, uh, you know, an amazing way to get started in tracking. And there's you know other ones that are built more for you know people who are really um, getting in the beginning. But I always recommend ones that have photographs. The ones with drawings are great. Um, they're a good way to get started too. But um, photographs, I tend to like just because you know you know for sure that's what um, left those tracks there. Um, you can see them much more clearly. It's the only reason I go for those. But ones with drawings can be helpful too for sure. Great, thanks, Ed. Um, the next question that we have here is any particular game camera that you recommend for home use? Um, there's, they're getting better and better all the, all the time. I mean, you can get right into, uh, you know, I think there really is no one brand that I'd like better than the other. I've used several of them. The only thing I would say is definitely get one with a microphone um, if you're gonna get one because you'd be surprised, uh, you know, what you're missing out on without a microphone. Sometimes you'll see an animal move through and then off camera, there'll be something else making a sound, the animal will make a sound, you know, something will catch its attention that you can, you wouldn't have been able to hear um, if you didn't have the microphone on there. So if you're doing reviews of one, I would search you know, Google One trail camera with good microphone because you know, some of them, they can be pretty tinny and it's hard to kind of hear what's going on back there. But ones with good microphones, that's a whole new dimension um, to you know the, the camera. So I would definitely recommend it along with it decent microphone for sure and the picture quality now is just getting more and more amazing on all of them so and they you know you can spend as much or as little as you want you know less than 100 bucks and over 600 bucks you know probably if you want it so but even the hundred dollar ones or less are really good now great thanks ed um so the next question is you mentioned fox hunt at dusk and dawn what <laughs> about coyotes specific time of day that they hunt yeah, similar. Uh, you know, most active uh, during dawn and dusk. Uh, you know, there's always the exception to the rule where sometimes you might see them during the day. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're ill or something's going on, especially when they're at pups. I've noticed that you tend to see them um, a little bit more during the day than you might. I know when the pups are young or when the uh, mother or um, you know, the, the parents are coming back from a, a hunt. If they sometimes they seem to get back a little bit later during the morning hours, like you know eight nine o'clock or something like that, uh, maybe even a little bit later than that. If they you know didn't have luck finding food, they'll look for a little bit longer to bring stuff back for their pups or whatever. But for the most part, for sure, um, they are dawn dusk or you know uh, at night as well. Great, thanks, Ed. Um, so the next question is: Do animals tend to use the same route repeatedly and step in their old tracks? Um, they definitely have, you know, a lot of animals do have their kind of set um, ter territories and set um, routes they like to go through. I, I wouldn't say that they use the same tracks over and over again, unless um, it is like, you know, deep snow 
and they really want to conserve energy and they want to reuse those tracks over and over again. But, you know, usually, you know, like for Fisher, for example, you know, there's one that goes by my place every several days or so, it's making its rounds again. It's always generally in the same area, but I wouldn't say it's always in the same, you know, it's not always flying the same spot where it was, but it is coming through kind of the same general area. Um, they do mix it up a little bit, but they do tend to have, you know, very similar um, kind of places that they explore, you know, every few days or so, depending on the animal and the size of their territory. The next question, and I believe this is the last question. Um, what about mountain lion sightings in the southeast, Florida or Panthers, Florida and Panthers? Um, so that, what's the question? What about mountain lion sightings in the southeast, Florida slash Panthers? Yeah, I mean, I'm not as familiar certainly with the with the southeast. Um, I can't really answer that with any degree of authority, so I'm not going to really uh, approach it. I mean, I do know that there are, um, you know, black panthers um, are that are seen in Florida. Um, it's endangered, um, but as far as how far they stretch out of that area, I don't, I can't say with any degree of certainty. So, I, yeah, I can't really answer that one. Not in the northeast, anyway, for sure. We might have to take your wildlife tracking expert title away from you for that one, Ed. <laughs> yeah, I'll work on it. Yeah, I'll see. I'll get back to you. But yeah. Okay, so I think that is the last question. Um, besides a lot of kudos for you, Ed, for this um, really informative and engaging talk. Um, thanks, Ed. As always, you're awesome at this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, for our first part of our mini series on wildlife tracking, um, I believe most of you registered for all three. Um, if you haven't and you want to register for the other two, um, you can register on our website. I put it in the chat, it's the same method, or you guys can email me and I'll put my email in the chat as well, although most of you have it by now. Um, we have a workshop uh, next week on March 9th on how you can become a community scientist and contribute to various research needs in Vermont. And if you're not located in Vermont, it'll still be a great opportunity to learn how you can use various community science tools. Um, so I hope to see some of you guys again. Um, thank you, you are all awesome. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks everybody, see you later. <laughs>